Hi everyone, welcome to FFBC Online. Uh, wherever you are today, I hope you're having a great day. Uh, just a reminder, if you've got a phone handy, why don't you grab uh, your phone and send somebody a quick message or a text or give them a quick phone call and, and just invite them to come along and join us online. Uh, and tell them to come to ffbclife.online.church uh, and be part of the service with us. Again, if you're on that site, as we always remind you, there is a live chat function. It's a great way just to connect with people. And then also there's opportunity for prayer. You can actually click a prayer function there. And whatever you type in that prayer function, that's absolutely confidential. And we'd love to pray with you and for you if you want to choose to use that particular function. And then straight after the service, we have our Zoom get togethers. And so what we'll do is if you keep an eye on the live chat, we put the details on how to join a Zoom meeting uh, in the live chat. And you'll be able to join us for a quick chat after, after the service today. I uh, also just want to remind you we have how to read the Bible for all it's worth continuing on. That'll be again on tomorrow night between 7 to 9. Uh, if you haven't registered and you'd like to join us for the remainder of the program, you're more than welcome to. Uh, you can either do that via Zoom or you can come and do it physically on site. So you just need to RSVP. You can actually do this uh, on the church webpage, ffbc.org.au. And there's an opportunity there to register for that. And once you do, we'll get in contact with you. Uh, and give you some more details. Uh, also, while you're on the church website, there's a great opportunity there to partner with us. Uh, one way you can partner with us is through your giving. And so if you go to the church web church webpage, you'll see the links to giving. You just follow those links and you'll be able to give online. Uh, let me take a moment just to pray for us. We're looking forward to a really great day today as we continue on uh, the series on Nehemiah. Let me pray. Father, as we go into this service today, our prayer would be that we would be open to you, that we'll listen to you, that, Father, that you would speak to us. Lord, we, we never want to be people that simply go through the motions. And so our prayer would be that as we, as we engage with you today, whether that we'd be sitting in our, our lounge room, our bedroom, a dining room, we're huddled around a computer or a laptop or an iPad, whatever it is, Lord, that you, you'll use uh, that platform to, to speak to us in some way. Uh, Father, we continue to pray for our world, Lord, as uh, both in terms of the COVID crisis, that again, that as, as well as we're going in our nation, we recognize that there's still many parts of the world that are, that are suffering tremendously because of this pandemic. And so again, Father, as we prayed for many, many weeks, both uh, publicly and privately, that you'll be giving wisdom to the leaders of nations and regions, that Father, that uh, you'll, you'll protect uh, people from uh, the, the, the worst experiences of, of this particular disease, Lord, uh, that uh, we grieve with those uh, that are grieving, that those who have been uh, so adversely affected by this, Lord. Uh, we also think about the riots. They're a few weeks old now, Lord, but the riots that were going on and the protests going on around the world and the angst that we all felt and the way in which uh, people are treated uh, because of their race or background, Father, and it's not right and it's not how you intended it to be. And so, Father, for those uh, that have been affected uh, personally by the events of uh, around uh, the death of George Floyd and the collateral from that, Lord, uh, Father, we ask that they would find comfort and strength in those that are rally around them, Father, that, again, you give the policymakers in nations around the world uh, wisdom and their decisions that they make, that Father, they can make uh, laws and make decisions that will produce better results in the future. Uh, Father, again, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Today's Bible reading is from Nehemiah chapter 2 verses 1 to 9 where Artaxerxes sends Nehemiah to Jerusalem. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was bought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers were buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? 
Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried, so that I may rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so they, they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letter. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, have you ever had uh, a moment or a thought in your life where you've looked back at it and you thought, I, I wonder if I might have been somewhere different in my career right now, or I, I wonder if I might have been somewhere different financially. Have, have you ever had a moment where you've looked back at your life or uh, going through a period in your life where you thought you, you might have been somewhere different from where you are at that particular moment? You might say, I thought I'd be further along in my life or, or further along in my career or that my life would be going at a different pace or a different direction. Perhaps you just thought it'd be somewhere different from what it is right now. Perhaps you look at the life of other people and you say, they seem to be moving ahead and moving forward and yet I feel like my life is stagnant and, and meaningless and a bit of a waste in comparison. Uh, if you've ever had thoughts like that or emotions like that or moments like that, that's what it is to be human. I think we all have moments like that where we wonder if our life is going to be successful, if our life is going to account for much or really mean much in, in the scheme of things. And yet what I love about the human experience, particularly when we bring God into the picture, is that a life can look like it's going in a particular direction and then God gets involved and he turns the whole thing upside down. And he takes a life that can feel meaningless and and fill it with meaning and a life that seems like it is a waste and make it a successful life a life that seems ordinary and make it extraordinary uh, a fisherman is by the lake of galilee and, and a rabbi comes to him and says come follow me and peter hears the voice of jesus and he comes and follows him and his life is forever changed he's no longer a fisherman he's a fisher of men he becomes uh, one of Jesus' closest followers and the foremost leader or one of the foremost leaders of the early church. His life is radically different because of this moment with God. You've got a shepherd uh, tending sheep around Mount Horeb when he sees a bush that has been burned but not consumed. He goes to investigate and hears the voice of God. He says, you, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of slavery in Egypt toward the promised land. And his life is forever changed. A, a life that had seemed to have lost its direction and meaning is now full of meaning and significance and purpose. And a young shepherd boy goes to bring cheese to his brothers on the battlefront. And when he goes, he hears the taunts of a Philistine giant by the name of Goliath. And he's taunting the God of Israel. He's taunting the people of Israel. And young David decides he wants to defend the honour of his people and the honour of God. And he steps into the fray and wins an unlikely victory that we still talk about some 3,000 years later. Uh, a successful life, an extraordinary life. And really, that's what I want to talk about this morning, this notion of how does God, or what's involved in God taking a life that feels ordinary and making extraordinary, a life that can feel like we're going through the motions and make it a successful life. How, how does God do that? What's the process? And, and I look at it through the lens of Nehemiah because Nehemiah is one such person that God did this with. Nehemiah's life seemed to be ordinary and going in a particular direction. And then he hears the words of the Persian king who says to him, what can I do for you? And, and Nehemiah knows that that, moment is a game changer. At that moment, God's got something in store for him and he lives a very different life uh, post that moment to the one he lived pre 
that moment. And so who is this Nehemiah that, that has, lives this extraordinary life? Well, the end of chapter 1, verse 11, we're told who Nehemiah is. I was cupbearer to the king. So Nehemiah's job is simply this. Wherever the king goes, whenever the king wants a drink, he would watch the, the drink get poured for the king and he would drink it first. Uh, if somebody sought to poison the king, well, he, he would get poisoned. That was the nature of the job. It's not a very enviable job. Uh, I'm not sure that many of us would actually like the idea of saying, hey, if anybody's going to take you out, they can take me out first. And, and yet the job actually got him close to the king. It got him in the palace. And, and, and as a result of this, every day he would put his life on the line for the king. And so he became someone that the king respected and the king trusted. And also someone the king probably depended on. And, and I think in some way this probably worked against him because... In chapter 1, when he, when he gets news about the fact that the state of Israel, that it, the city of Jerusalem is in disrepair, the walls are still torn down, that the, the gates are still burned, that the people are in disarray. When he feels this great burden to do something about it, what can he do? It almost seems impossible. He, he can't slip away and be unnoticed, particularly in the position that he holds. And, and his boss, the person who needs permission to leave from, Seems like the last person in the world that would be interested in restoring the capital of a former uh, powerhouse in the region. And so why would, why would the king Artaxerxes have any interest in watching the walls of Jerusalem get rebuilt and the people of Israel be reestablished and restored? And so from Nehemiah's perspective, the, the whole thing must seem hopeless. It seems like his very position actually works against him. And yet you know, what's really, really fascinating about this story that the very circumstances which seem to conspire against Nehemiah being able to pursue what God's placed on his heart is the very thing that God's going to use. Those, the, the, those circumstances, that event, God is going to use to change the circumstances of Israel because Nehemiah ends up being the right person in the right place at the right time. And so often we, our lives can feel like we're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Have you ever felt that? You feel like your life, you know, you're always in, you're always in the wrong place and that what you're doing is meaningless. It doesn't seem to make any difference. You're sort of going through your emotions. And, and Nehemiah must have felt that. I mean, here he is a Jew and he's born in Persia and he's raised in Persia. He's working for the Persian king and yet his heart is for Israel. And he must feel like, here I am. I've got all these yearnings and desires and this burden and yet I, I, I can do nothing about it. And, and yet what I love about this story is God takes our circumstances and he can change them and use them for his purposes. So I don't care what your background is. I don't care what choices you've made, what past you have, uh, what mistakes you've made. Uh, the beauty of God is he can take all those circumstances and he can use them to, in, in you to feel the purpose he has for your life. And that's what he does with Nehemiah. He, he takes these circumstances that Nehemiah finds himself in and he's going to orchestrate these events. And so immediately when Nehemiah gets news about the state of Israel, he knows what he wants to do. He wants to go to Jerusalem. He wants to rebuild the walls. He wants to restore the people of Israel. But his question is how? How does he do that? How is it even going to be possible? And, and that's what unfolds in chapter 2. And so chapter 2 starts this way. Nehemiah 2.1 In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. Oh, I just want to pause the story there for a moment. There's a little detail that we could easily miss. It says in the month of Nisan. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 1, we're told it was a month of Kislev. And by the time we get from chapter 1 to chapter 2, four months have passed. Four months have come and gone. And nothing seems to have changed. I wonder how many times Nehemiah prayed that prayer from chapter 1 over the four-month period. I wonder if he prayed and prayed and prayed, and yet nothing happened between Kislev and Nissen. Uh, have you ever been there? That God stirs something in you, and, and you pray, and you're waiting on God, and nothing seems to happen. The walls are still torn down. The gates are still burned. The people are still in disarray, and you're still cupbearer to the king. And so you feel like a failure. 
And I wonder if there the are moments when Nehemiah must have felt like a failure because he hadn't achieved the goal. He, had, he wasn't getting the rewards just yet. And, and it seems to me sometimes we confuse a success or living a successful life with, did I get the rewards or the recognition? Did I, did I cross the finish line the way that I'd hoped or anticipated? See, is Nehemiah only successful when he gets a king's ear? Is he only successful when uh, the king grants his request? Is he only successful when he rallies the troops? Is he only successful when he rebuilds the walls? What is it that makes Nehemiah's life successful? See, is my life only successful when I get the promotion? Is your life only successful when you get the top grade in your exam? Is Nehemiah only successful when he rebuilds the walls and rallies the troops and restores the people of Israel? That's what he desires, but is that all there is to a successful life? So I wonder if successful life isn't just about the rewards or achieving the goal. It's the choices that we make, the things that we can control. I, I would say success for Nehemiah is when he feels his burden and he lays in bed at night and starts to plan and dream with God the inventory that he would need to rebuild the wall. I wonder if it's when he prays day in, day out for God to give him opportunity to make this happen. I wonder if the success for life is actually the life of faithfulness and trust in God for the things that he can control and, and not feeling that he's unsuccessful for things that he can't control. He can't control what the king will do. He can't control whether his requests will be granted. He'll keep praying about those things, but success is him pursuing the thing that God has called him to do. And so if we think a successful life is just about the rewards, then we can often feel discouraged. We can feel like life is a failure because I, I didn't get the reward. I didn't get promotion. I didn't get the grade. I didn't get what I thought I would. And the question is, but have you been faithful? Have you worked hard? Have you studied hard? Have you done what God called you to do? Have you prayed? Have you looked for opportunities? Uh, that is success. That's a successful life. And yet there's something in every one of us that when we don't get that thing that we, that we want most, the, the, thing, the thing that we think would define success in this moment, we feel like a failure. And we get down and we get discouraged. And certainly that was the experience of Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah gets discouraged. Listen again to chapter 2. Nehemiah 2.1 In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. Uh, there's a moment where Nehemiah lets his guard down. I, I think it's a very human uh, moment. It's, it's a very real moment that we can feel that way, that it, if we don't achieve success, if things aren't working out the way that we expected them to, we can feel like we're failures. I, I, I understand Nehemiah in that respect because so often it feels like it's all or nothing. It's either a success or a failure. That's it. I remember in 2013, Jen and I were traveling in India and we're in the northern part of India at a place called Dehradun. There's this beautiful little town on the foothills of the Himalayas. And we met with a group of church planters who were going to little villages and towns in the, in the Himalayas and just letting them know about Jesus and if they could start a church or start a church. And they're, they're just a remarkable group of people. And I'm meant to be teaching them some stuff, but I don't think there was much I could teach them. I, their faith was extraordinary. But I do remember praying with them. And as we're praying one day, we're, they started praying for this guy that had a sore back. And as they prayed, they, they started to pray this way. They said, Lord, we want to pray for such and such. And we want to thank you that his back is on the mend. That, Lord, we reckon he's about 80% there. But, and we want to thank you for what you've done. But we're going to keep praying that you'll get him up to the 100%. And I remember hearing that prayer and thinking, I don't pray that way. We, we don't pray that way. For us, he's either healed or he's not. He's restored or he's not. You've answered it or you haven't. There's either been success or there's been failure. And it seems to me, we, we don't pray that way. We don't think about success and failure. We don't celebrate the, the movement of God. You know, for, 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 for me, for us, it's, it's either God, you've delivered or you haven't. And I wonder if we ought to reorient or rethink our attitude to what a successful life looks like if we need to pause more and say, oh God, I recognize that you're actually moving things forward. We're not there yet, but you, I can see what you're doing, Lord. We're 10% closer, we're 20% closer, we're 80% closer. 
And so often what can happen is if we just think life or or success is just about failure or success, it's about everything or nothing, we actually set ourselves up for discouragement. Because we we don't feel like we're always a failure and there comes a point where it's very easy just to want to abandon this thing, this purpose, this call that God's got in your life because you think, I'm not being successful, I'm not achieving anything. And I wonder if we, we ought to stop every now and then and take stock of the little steps that God is making and taking and moving, how he's progressing things and moving things forward. You might be praying for a spouse and, and that they are not yet following Jesus. But how about you stop and Lord, and say, Lord, I want to thank you that they're a little more open. Or I'm a little more courageous now in the way I'm sharing my faith, whatever it is. It, recognize that God is doing something in them or in you or in that circumstance. You might have a burden to start a ministry and you don't have a team yet. You can feel like a failure because you don't have a team rallied around you yet. But maybe take stock of the fact that you're getting to share it or you're refining your vision or maybe that God is starting to get John or Jan or somebody else that's interested in your ministry. Maybe it's your marriage and you might look at your marriage, compare it to somebody else and say, you might say, oh, my, my marriage isn't like that. But maybe you need to stop and say, Lord, but I think my, my marriage is progressing and growing and getting stronger. And I wonder if we need to stop thinking about success or the successful life as, as all or nothing. And recognize that, that we just need to be faithful in these moments and recognize what God is doing. And so if you find yourself living between Kislev and Nissan, the successful life is just continue to be faithful and recognize that you might only be minutes or moments away from arriving in that final place in Nissan. And that's exactly what happens for Nehemiah. He's been faithful for four months. I think he's been successful. He's been dreaming, he's been planning, he's been praying. He's done what he can control. He's looking for opportunities. All the stuff he can control, he's doing. He just can't control. And it's understandable that he feels discouraged. We all feel that. But I don't think he's a failure at this point. But then the the, the month of Nisan comes. And listen what happens then. Nehemiah 2, 1 and 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you were not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Uh, Nehemiah has been faithful to God for four months. He's been praying. He's been doing his duty. He's he's doing his best. And then he lets his guard down. And, And at this point, what you'd actually expect is the king to throw him out. Uh, yeah, your job, if you work for the king, is to be always bringing delight to the king. You, you, you're not meant to uh, lament or be sad, or you're not meant to bring anything negative into the throne room, into the presence of the king. And and so you'd expect that this story, at, at this particular point, that the king looks at him and says, get out of my presence until you can sort it out. And yet that's not what happens. What, what happens is really, really surprising. It's really unexpected. He asks his servant if he's okay. And if that's not a strange moment, what happens next makes it even more strange. Nehemiah 2, 2 and 3. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? To which we say like, what, what, what is, Nehemiah, you, you don't answer the king that way. You apologize, you change your demeanor, you, you, you don't go on about your ancestors and, you, and you, the town where you're buried, they're buried and that's not the way this, this is meant to go. And see, Nehemiah knows he has to make a choice at this point, he, he, he's, he's afraid. And he has to decide this moment, what is more weighty for him, to give in to his fear or to find the courage to talk about the restoration of his people. What is more weighty for him? What matters most for him? Nehemiah is a smart man. He recognized that this is the opportunity they've been praying for. He's been praying for four months that God would give him this opportunity. He may not get another. 
And so he makes a courageous decision, the bold decision. He steps into the moment. He seizes the moment. And he gives a detailed account of the state of his people and of Jerusalem. And the question is, what will the king say? Nehemiah 2.4, the king said to me, what is it you want? To which Nehemiah says nothing. Well, not immediately. I mean, Nehemiah knows that God is in this or is not. That this is going to be a moment of courage or a moment of folly. And so Nehemiah does this. We're told the second half of verse 4. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Uh, have you ever had a moment like that, that you're fearful, you're frightened? You, you, in a sense, you're standing for the king and you don't know how this is going to go. And so what do you do? You pray under your breath, you pray in your mind, you pray like crazy. Because you know you can't control this, this wasn't your making, this wasn't your doing. And so you're just asking God, will you take care of this? And and so Nehemiah prays, and it's not unusual for Nehemiah to pray. Throughout this book, time and time again, one of the key characteristics of Nehemiah, of his successful life, is that Nehemiah is smart enough to know that he can't own this, he can't force this, he can't control this. This is completely and utterly God. And so he comes to God over and over and over again. And that little line, then I prayed to the God of of heaven is not incidental to this story. It is essential to this story. Nehemiah lives a life of prayer. Earl McManus in his book, Season the Divine Moment, makes this observation. Prayer is an obstacle to seizing our divine moments when we neglect to pray. Prayer keeps you in step with God's spirit and in tune with his voice. The purpose of prayer is to keep you connected and when you're connected to God, you're moving with him. Prayer that connects you to God positions you to seize your divine moment. This kind of prayer gives you the courage to live the life of the adventurer. And that's what Nehemiah does at this moment. He, he pauses, he connects, he reorients himself with God. He finds the courage to step forward. That line that he decided, where he decided to pray is not incidental to the story. It is critical to the story. And there's a great temptation when, when these moments occur to, to rush ahead. You know, he's prepared this speech. He's practiced it a thousand times. He's been looking for this opportunity. He's ready to go. But Nehemiah is a smart man. He knows this is a moment from God. And so when this moment happens, he doesn't rush. When these moments are arises what does he do he gets in a sense on his knees not not literally but figuratively and i wonder sometimes is rather than rushing forward we our first step needs to be okay god i see what you're doing here i need to get on my knees i need to pause i need to connect i need to find the courage to take the next step rather than rushing ahead and saying i've got this i'm ready to go and so what does nehemiah do he gets on his knees and he prays and he finds the courage and he moves ahead and does what God calls him to do. And it's really interesting because up to this point, Nehemiah knew that God wanted him to do something, but he didn't know how it was going to happen. Right from the start, he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to go to Jerusalem, he wanted to rebuild the wall, he wanted to restore the people. But the problem was how? How was he ever going to bring this up to the king? How was he ever going to get the king's favour? He didn't know how. And that's not uncommon. Uh, Andy Stanley in his book, Visionary, makes this observation. You will know what God has put in your heart to do before you know how he intends to bring it about. Often you'll know what long before you know how. I think it's a really interesting observation. Uh, so often we can know the what long before we know the how. Uh, that was Nehemiah's experience. I think right from the start he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to go to Jerusalem and he wanted to restore Israel. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. The question was how? How was this going to be possible? How could he get the ear of the king? How could the king uh, support his plans? Uh, how, how could any of this be possible? Uh, and yet we love the how. I love the how. If somebody gives me an idea, I want to know how they're going to do it. Uh, the how makes us feel like we're in control, that we, we can map this out. We can figure it out. We can control it in some way. 
Uh, you ever had a moment where you've got something and you know God has stirred something in you and there's a burden, there's a concern that you're carrying and then you share it with somebody else. You know exactly what needs to happen, but you, do, you don't have it all figured out yet. And, and they inevitably ask you, how? How are you going to fund that? How are you going to get a team together? How are you going to achieve this? And, and, and it's so deflating because you, you don't have all the answers. You just know exactly what God has placed in your heart. And so often the, the what comes way before the how. Moses knew that God wanted him to lead the people of Israel from Egypt out of slavery into the promised land. And then plays get sent to force a hand of Pharaoh. And how does that happen? Whose idea was that? It was God's. Moses knew what he wanted to do, but God, along the way, revealed how that was going to happen. When he gets to the Red Sea, he's got the Red Sea in front of him. He's got Pharaoh's army behind him. He knows that God wants to protect and care for his people, but how is he going to get out of this? And then the sea is open. He walks on dry ground, and then Pharaoh's army follows, and the sea closes over the top of them. Who thought of that how? God. Sometimes all we know is the what, and then later on, God reveals the how. Jesus and his disciples are on a mountainside that 5,000 men plus women and children have gone to hear Jesus teach and perform miracles. It gets late in the day, and they're hungry, and there's concern about sending them home or feeding them. And the disciples know, and Jesus knows that they need to be fed. And so Jesus gets some bread, gets some fish, he prays for them or he prays for God to do something about this. He miraculously uh, multiplies the bread and the fish and 5,000 men plus women and children are fed with 12 basketfuls left over. Who thought of the how? Jesus did. And, and, and so often all we've got is the what. Sometimes the what precedes the how and sometimes God gives you the what and, he, and in his own time when he's ready, he reveals the how. And that was the experience of Nehemiah. He knew what needed to happen. He just didn't know how it was going to happen. And, and I'm not saying you, you shouldn't have plans. I'm not saying plans are bad. In fact, Nehemiah had some plans. We see this in verses 7 and 8. I also said to him, If it pleases a king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park. So he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. Nehemiah had these plans, but only if the king would support them. The question was how? How would that happen? He knew what right from the start. God had placed this burden on him about uh, his people about restoring Jerusalem, about rebuilding the walls. He, he had that right from the start, but the question was, how would this be possible? How would he even get the ear of the king? He knew what very early on, but the question remained, how was this going to happen? Now, why is this so important? If you're at a place where you just have this strong sense that God of what God wants you to do, but you just don't know how, Understand that, that sometimes God gives you the what before he gives you the how. And that he give you the how when he's ready in his timing. I mean, for four months, Nehemiah has been praying that some, probably the same prayer day in, day out. The, the walls are still being torn down. The gates are still being burned. The city is not being restored. He's still cut buried to the king. He doesn't know how this is ever going to to happen. He doesn't know how this is ever going to work out. But he knows he needs the king. And then one day, he's downcast and the Persian king asks the cupbearer, what can I do for you? And at that moment, that moment, he knows that's how God is going to do this. And it wasn't that he petitioned the king. It wasn't that he wrote it a letter to the king. It wasn't that he asked for a special audience with the king. 
It was that God had softened the heart of the Persian king for his cupbearer, that he became concerned about his cupbearer and asked him, what can I do for you? Who would have thought of that? But that's how God chose to do it. Because Nehemiah needed the king. Uh, Jerusalem had been in ruins for over a hundred years. Uh, Nehemiah had grown up in Persia. He'd never been to Jerusalem. Even if he could get there, nobody knew him. Why would they listen to him? How could he rally the troops? Uh, and he needed to, he needed the resources of the king. He needed the authority of the king. He needed the protection of the king. He needed all those things for this to happen. How was that going to happen? It happens because he has this moment where the king says, what can I do for you? And that's how God opens this moment up. And why is it? What was the secret? Why is it that the king would be so open to these requests and grant the requests of Nehemiah? Listen again to the end of verse 8. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Notice who gets the credit. It wasn't his patience. It wasn't his preparation. It wasn't his personality. Uh, Nehemiah recognizes the reason that he had success was God, simply God. God orchestrated this. God planned this. God had engineered this entire thing to happen. And there's great danger that when we have a moment of success that we can too easily forget God. Too often there is like, thank you, God, I can handle it from here. I can take care of it from here. I mean, too many times I've, I've seen stories, I've heard stories where, where the story starts with somebody giving credit to God, but then they, in the end they take credit for themselves, that they, they recognize God for their calling, but they want to draw attention to themselves for what they have done. The story starts with how God good is, how good God is, and it ends with what they've achieved, rather than like Nehemiah, who says, how is this possible because of the graciousness of God? Andy Stanley writes, Success has a way of winning us off our dependency on God. In the throes of success, it is easy to take the responsibility for maintaining our success. Without ever meaning to, we shift from a God orientation to a self orientation. And you see, what we learn here in these early moments are meant to carry us through our life. What's the key to a successful life? It's here in the story of Nehemiah. It's about being concerned about the things that concern God. It's when you find yourself between Kislev and Nissan that you wait on God and you pray on God and you trust that he's got something in store and you don't give up and you reorient your thinking about success and failure, that success or failure is not whether I get the rewards, it's not whether I, I achieved the mission in one hit, it's not whether I arrived yet, it's have I been faithful? Have I been faithful between Kislev and Nissan? Have I been faithful long? And when that moment happens, will I continue to lean into God? Will you pause? Will you pray? Will you connect? When, when you see God doing something, do you get on your knees first in a sense and just say, God, I want to pause and connect and find the courage to do what you call me to do? Are you looking for those moments, those 10%, those 20%, those moments where God is moving your heart or moving the circumstances or moving in this other person's life where you say, hey, God, I thank you for the 10%, the 20%, the 80% of what you're doing here. See, the successful life is not whether I get to do it all. It's whether I'm open to seeing what God can do in and through me. And I'm, am I being faithful to that which I can control? And when you arrive, learn from Nehemiah. And don't say, hey, thanks, God, I can handle it from here. But say, hey, how is this possible? Because God's gracious hand was with me. And may you live such a life. May you know such a successful life in Christ.
Take me 